And so I'm delighted to invite Corey Ulislau today. Corey is a professor and Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Translation Genomics at UBC. And today, Corey will consider viral genomics, why the outcomes of the 1918 Spanish flu and COVID-19 will differ. And Corey, I invite you to take over the screen. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Aideen, for that. Uh, uh, describe the title of my talk. I won't uh, go over that again. I'll jump right in. And before I start, I'd like to say that um, my, um, my work today that I'm going to share with you has been aided in large part by two very accessible uh, popular science books, um, and they're shown here, The Great Influenza by John Barry, which is reissued every time we're faced with a new um, pandemic, as well as the popular science book by the science writer from the New York Times, Gina Collada. These are really the only two uh, layperson uh, resources, but they're quite good. And I'd like to start with this quote, hoping that it turns out not to be true uh, uh, today um, or, or uh, in, the in the near future. And that is, we learn from history that we do not learn from history. Unfortunately, that has been the case um, in the history of pandemics. So let's consider what has and hasn't changed since 1918. And we'll touch on these um, briefly, um, and I'll, I'll try to focus on what I know and, and not spend too much time on, on stuff outside of my area of expertise. What hasn't changed is human nature. It's pretty much as it always has been, and human nature actually plays a very large role in how pandemics unfold. What has changed is science has seen incredible advances. We're now armed with antibiotics um, and antivirals, which we didn't have in 1918. Um, and we have the new disciplines of studying the whole genomes of cells, the whole proteomes of cells and organisms, and a, a whole host of interdisciplinary variations of these big biological approaches. Hospital care has improved, as have medical devices. Has society changed um, uh, since 1918? Surely. Has it changed in a way that's going to affect the outcome of the pandemic? we're not so sure. Has government changed? Well, that I'd say not as much as it needs to. Um, but I'll leave, on a, I'll leave this slide on an um, encouraging note. Supporting technology in fields outside of biology and other medical sciences has changed quite a bit. So a couple of fast facts, and I'm not going to read everything on this slide. Um, there are some similarities between the, uh, the pandemic we faced in 1918 and 1919 and today, um, but m there are actually more differences. Um, both COVID-19, the virus we're facing today, and the Spanish flu, which I should say right here, the Spanish flu is a misnomer. Um, they were both novel viruses. That means there are no treatments, no vaccines, and when they first arrived, no one had immunity. Um, in comparison, in 1918, viruses um, hadn't even been isolated yet, and we didn't even understand the, the nature of her DNA as a hereditary molecule. Um, I'd like to mention that um, the reason for the name Spanish flu was that during World War I, the, um, the governments that were fighting had a lockdown on news, um, a strong censorship effort. Spain, however, was neutral. So the, the news of this flu first came out in Spain. It didn't first appear there, but it first came, the news came out there, and so the name stuck. The, the virus probably was brought to Spain by Americans. Um, uh, many other things were the same in terms of the, uh, the illness um, and the deaths and the closures and the social distancing, although it wasn't called that back then. Um, and let's fla flash forward to um, today, and many of the things we're facing are the same. A little bit more about 1918. Um, there are the, the, the idea of where this virus originated in 1918 has been uh, revised multiple times. Um, and uh, one of the most recent ideas was that 
it came from pigs. And I'll talk about how that may have happened, but it didn't happen in 1918. Um, we most we found it in pigs after 1918, but that's because we most certainly gave it to pigs after night after the pandemic passed. Um, and interestingly, the virus after it appeared, it disappeared rather quickly in the 1920s, and it was almost lost to science forever. And that's a there, that's a key fact that um, will not happen with the coronavirus. Also in 1918 there were three major waves of illness. The first was rather mild. The second, which is where most people died, uh, was 10 times worse, worse in, in terms of death than the first. And then there was a third wave that you don't hear very much about, and that was three times worse than the first. We're only in the first wave of coronavirus right now, so that's a little sobering. As I mentioned, we didn't lose, we almost lost the, uh, Spanish flu virus, but it has been uh, revived. And that, um, that was a 90 year effort, to, um, which is uh, well, uh, well covered in Gina Colada's book, The Flu. So what is COVID-19? It's a novel coronavirus infection. Um, it's a respiratory infection. The first uh, a name was SARS-CoV-2. Um, um, that's still the formal name of the virus. COVID-19 is the name of the disease. It's related to SARS and MERS, and we'll talk about that briefly. Um, the respiratory symptoms that manifest are fever, cough, shortness of breath, breath and pneumonia. It was first identified um, certainly by December 2019 in Wuhan, China, possibly um, earlier, possibly as early as November in 2019. It probably originated in an animal and is now spreading um, rapidly via human to human trans, uh, transmission. There's currently no vaccine or antiretroviral treatment um, and many clinical trials are underway for both drugs as well to ameliorate symptoms as well as multiple vaccine efforts. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that human history is uh, can be thought of as the history of pandemics. Here we see, um, just want to point out a couple, the Black Death in, um, in the 13, 1400s killed over 200 million people. And back then that was a third of the entire population of the planet. To put things in perspective, um, the um, Spanish flu of 1918 and 19 shown here killed at least 40 to 50 million people. Um, HIV AIDS 25 to 35 million and the novel coronavirus down here we don't yet have good models um, as to what the final toll will be. So why are we always so I just showed you all the pandemics we've ever seen why are we so unprepared for the next pandemic and there's a parable that's popular um, in, in explaining why and I'll, I'll try my best to do this. You have a pond that has one lily pad in it. And on day 30, the pond is completely covered with lily pads. So um, every day, the number of lily pads doubles. The question I have to you guys is, on what day is the pond half covered? And the answer, because you can't, um, I can't ask you, uh, is on day 29. Okay, so maybe some of you got that. Another question is, on what day is the pond only 1% covered by lily pads? I'll let you noodle on it for a second, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna tell you the answer. The answer is on day 27. So there's why, at least one reason why we miss pandemics, is because we're looking at this clear pond and for the first 27 days, it looks fine. It's not until day 29 that we see we have a problem. We have to do better. And some of the reasons we don't do better is that we commit logical fallacies. We, um, we fall to the comfort of anecdotes. We also, again, this is the human nature part, we have cognitive biases. We suffer from optimism bias from framing things that they're going to be better, from looking for things that confirm what we already know. So this is where um, 
uh, um, uh, human nature comes into play. We're going to go back to science now for the rest of the talk. Um, I want to convey to you that viruses um, are uh, probably the, um, uh, the they are the most rapidly mutable um, um, uh, uh, diseases that you'll come into con contact with. They mutate rapidly, and this rapid mutation allows them to so-called cross between species or jump from one species to another. And that's where the real trouble begins. So in this jumping phenomenon, the virus will be in an original host, and then, so that could be a bat, then a shared host, say a pig, um, that, and, the, and a new host, for example, human beings. And during this traverse from the original host to the shared host to the new host, genetic rearrangement is occurring, as well as natural mutations. Um, and evolution is acting on both of those rearrangements and mutations to make viruses more potent. Now, from the point of view of evolution, um, COVID-19, the Spanish flu virus, are not ideal viruses because they kill their hosts. Um, and a, an ideal virus, if you want to think of it that way, is one that's extremely contagious but does not kill its host. So um, an example of one end of the spectrum is Ebola, where it's extremely lethal and not very contagious. Um, influenza, which is extremely contagious, but normal influenza, not very lethal. And then COVID-19 falls somewhere in the middle. Um, and here's just a, a startling graphic that shows you that um, uh, viruses can um, commingle between a number of different organisms. Uh, you've heard of avian flu. Um, the Spanish flu had most of its genome originated with birds. Um, it can mix in pigs and interactions between humans and pigs allow the virus to be transmitted, an avian virus to be transmitted to pigs and then to humans. Um, and here's another example, I'm not gonna go into details, but these colored lines here are the, the genes of the virus. And you can see in the first panel in 1918, all the genes were from bird. Um, they were then mixed uh, with human genes in 1957, further mixed with swine um, to get a triple reassortment. So you have this massive um, um, genetic flexibility in, um, in the genome, the, all the genes in the viral genome, and that allow it to jump to uh, opportunistically to a number of different organisms. As I said, the mo um, or I didn't say, but the most likely um, reservoirs for COVID-19 are bats and this um, cute little scaled animal here, uh, pangolin. And how does this happen? Well, um, we, we predict or uh, we speculate that the mixing for the current virus happened in these so-called wet markets where live animals are traded um, this is a picture of a, a live uh, animal market in, um, in Wuhan. And the, the close quarters uh, with different types of animals that are infected and human beings really provide a petri dish for the kinds of viral transmission that, we, that, that can lead to pandemics. So now I'm gonna go through a five minute story about how coronavirus hijacks our cells and how learning about that phenomenon can help us develop uh, remedies and countermeasures. So here's the coronavirus, and this is a, a beautiful infographic by John Corum and Carl Zimmer from the New York Times. Um, here's the coronavirus. These spike pro proteins on the outside of the virus are gonna come into play in a moment. And here's the genome on the inside. Um, the virus binds to a receptor on our, the cells in our lungs. The, the receptor is a protein called ACE2, and some, uh, some researchers at UBC are actually working on ways to fake this receptor out, to think it's binding, or fake the virus out to think it's binding this receptor as a countermeasure. So it binds to cells in the upper respiratory tract 
and the lower respiratory tract. That's important because um, most flus only affect the upper respiratory tract. These go into the upper and lower. That means by the time you get sick, you already have a deeply penetrated lung infection. And then bacterial infections follow quickly thereafter. Um, after the virus uh, binds to the receptor, it pops into the cell and then releases its genome, uh, which is made out of RNA, into the cell. It doesn't have the mechanisms to copy its own genome. It's not really alive. It has to rely on the host to do that. So this is what happens inside the cell. These, these little balls here are the protein-making machinery of the cell. It takes the viral RNA and makes proteins needed for the virus to build more copies of itself. Um, here's a cartoon of inside the cell with the nucleus here. And these um, protein machineries are pumping out viral proteins. Um, as new copies of the viral proteins are made, the virus now has all of the pieces to make new copies of itself. And that's what it does. It makes thousands and thousands of copies to itself, of itself and then moves those copies to the edge of the cell. Uh, once those uh, copies of the virus reach the edge of the cell, they are um, spit out uh, from the cell using the normal machinery of the cell to either infect a neighboring cell in your airways or um, um, they find their way to um, spit or, um, or um, respiratory droplets and they travel to another human being uh, through a respiratory droplet. Um, and once they leave the virus, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they can travel at least two meters possibly more, depending on humidity, depending on a lot of things. Um, and here uh, to the right of your screen is just a, a, uh, a uh, simulation of after you leave the outdoors and return to your home as an infected individual, where you would find viral particles. And these viral particles in green are all over the place, and they can survive for up to 24 hours at least, if not longer. So they're infectious. Okay, so that's all bad news. Let's, some good news is a, a vaccine could stop or slow infections in the population. So um, here's the virus um, um, on the right of your screen. These Y-shaped critters are antibodies made by, um, by you uh, if you're infected or made in the laboratory as a vaccine. And they would bind to um, the virus and inactivate it, preventing it from infecting your cells. That's the goal. The problem is they take time to develop. They take time to find the right antibody and then to scale up the production of those antibodies so that they can treat a whole population. Furthermore, they're not ever 100% effective. The most effective um, uh, way to be um, immune from the 1918 flu was to get it and survive it. That gave you about 80% protection. Most, vi most vaccines don't give you that. Um, and uh, another issue with vaccines is that the virus is constantly mutating. So um, antibody uh, if, you, if you received, um, if you got sick with the 1918 flu with the second wave, you were protected from getting from the second wave. You were not protected from the third wave. So we need to build an arsenal of vaccines, and that's very expensive, but it's doable. And ultimately, combining a vaccine with a therapeutic drug that modulates your immune response, combined with social distancing measures, are the are going to be the new normal for managing uh, this virus. And finally, this is a um, this slide is is it should be optimistic in that here's the it shows here's the virus shows the virus entering the cell here, and then all of the host activities that are required for the the virus to properly make copies of this. We know a lot of these steps from the decades of study of the HIV virus. And each one of these red arrows 
presents an opportunity for either a drug that could alleviate the, the severity of the symptoms or potentially represent a, a, a vaccine intervention. So you could prevent the virus from binding, you could prevent uh, the uncoding of the virus, you can block the chopping up of the virus into pieces so that it can rebuild more, you can find drugs that uh, prevent release. So there are opportunities um, for developing new therapies. So let's get to know our enemy a little bit. This is the virus. Uh, it's about 100 nanometers uh, in, si in diameter. That's 100 millionths of a meter. Um, and it's composed of a number of proteins on the outside here and its RNA genome inside. Um, so now uh, one main difference uh, between 1918 and today is that it took 90 years to, to reconstruct the genetic code of the 1918 virus. Um, it took 11 days to decode the genetic code of the novel coronavirus. And because, with that information in hand, what this map is, I'm showing you, if you just follow this arrow, red arrow here, is a map of the genome of all of the proteins in the coronavirus genome. And we can compare it to all of the other known coronaviruses and find out how quickly it diverged from those other coronaviruses. So build an evolutionary tree, if you will, of this coronavirus. Um, here's, a here's another picture of uh, the coronavirus genome. All of these little boxes here are proteins um, encoded by the genome. And these, this is how similar the coronavirus is to the bat genome, the pangolin genome, and other uh, viral genomes. Um, so they're quite similar, but different enough that they're able to jump from a bat to a human. Down here, you can see the evolution and mutation rates. Um, the, you don't need to know the, the numbers in detail other than to say that every time the virus divides, it accumulates at least one mutation. So it's, it's always mutated. Um, here's a evolutionary tree that offers a, a, a glimmer of hope. Uh, it was collected um, in March. And this is the genome sequence of all the virus uh, genomes, COVID uh, genomes that were available at the time. And I'm not going to go into great detail here. Um, I'm happy to answer questions uh, later. But what uh, the take home message of this is that all of these COVID-19 genomes are fairly tightly clustered. Um, uh, and that means that as of, as of today, the genome has not undergone a radical mutation event, which is encouraging news. Um, okay, I want to switch gears to, um, because related to knowing our enemy and knowing the genome of the virus is testing for who's infected. Um, and right now, uh, when, you, when you hear about tests, um, people, they really should be discriminating between the two types of tests that we're talking about. The first test is, are you infected? That test is done using something called polymerase chain reaction, which can take one molecule of virus and in an hour or two uh, provide you with millions of molecules of virus um, to, uh, to analyze. That technology invented in 1984 is used to detect if you have the virus in your body. Now, Interesting, and it's very effective. Interestingly, it's also the reason that the CDC lost about a month in their testing capability. Because of the sensitivity of these tests, any little contaminant in the laboratory can give a false positive, and that's what happened with the CDC. But these are the tests that are being offered, some in, um, in doctor's offices, some in hospitals. That tells you, are you, are you infected at the moment? What's going to be really important if we're able to, to be able to open up our economies again and slowly dial down the social distancing measures is to understand, were you infected? And the, the, the implication there is, if you were infected, um, the hope is, I should say, that you have some level of immunity to reinfection. Now, I've already told you 
we don't know if that's the case. We don't know if infection confers immunity. And furthermore, we don't know if infection to this wave will confer immunity to the potential next wave. So with that as a caveat, here's how the antibody tests work. You lay down viral particles, and then you flow in blood. It's, it's, it's essentially a pregnancy dipstick test. On one line of the dipstick is um, our, anti our antibodies to the virus. On the other line is a control. You flow in um, body fluid, and then a color will develop telling you whether you're a positive or negative. These tests are very much a work in progress. They're n I, my opinion, only my opinion, is they're not yet good enough uh, for widespread distribution. The German antibody test looks pretty good. Hopefully that will be more widely disseminated. I don't have time for this, but um, every time you hear that this is just like a bad flu, be skeptical. It's not. Um, and a key difference is that the flu uh, incubation period is a few days. COVID-19 incubation period is up to 14 days. That makes everything longer and slower and it impacts the outcome. I want to turn um, in the last uh, two or three minutes to some of the things that people are doing. Um, you, you, you've heard, I'm sure, in the news about drugs like chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, um, some antivirals that are being rapidly pushed into clinical trials. Um, and I'm not going to, well, the, any, no drug should be taken uh, from the pharmacy and tried on a patient without some good science behind it. So um, that said, we don't have time to develop new drugs. So drug repurposing is an effort to take existing drugs and based on good science or good scientific intuition, develop tests that can uh, uh, inform us whether or not they'll be uh, useful in uh, reducing the severity of uh, COVID-19 um, effects. Our lab is actively engaged in this, as are many others at UBC. I'm not going to spend any more time on that. Um, I do want to, uh, uh, a lot of people in the news have been saying, um, well, we had no way to know that this was coming. I just want to dispense with that. We had plenty of warning. This is a long list of 25 uh, very clear warnings dating all the way back to 2005, but even further. Um, and the, the, the fact of the matter is, if you have an emergency kit, you keep that emergency kit and you keep improving it and hope you never ever need to use it. Um, you don't dismiss the emergency kit and everyone who made it. Uh, uh, that'll, that'll be all the politics. Here's a, a little bit of uh, a snapshot of, this is the last class I taught in person at UBC. Um, and this website shows the accumulation of cases. On March 11th, we had 126,000 cases. Fast forward to this morning, two and a half million cases. So the number of infected individuals is, uh, the curve is slowing down, but the number of affected individuals is still climbing. So um, I hope to not have been too depressing um, uh, or too pessimistic. So where can we find reasons to be hopeful? Well, this is a quote from Chernobyl. Uh, the real danger is that if we hear enough lies, then we no longer recognize the truth at all. I have hope that the folks on this, um, in this um, class and across the country will recognize that we have to be skeptical and we have to challenge people who are only telling us what we want to hear. And one of the really great, out, or one of the, the positive outcomes of the past few weeks is that science and scientific culture has, is changing very rapidly in response to COVID-19. Information is being shared more freely. The Chinese group that sequenced the virus, decoded the virus in 11 days, immediately published that data without waiting for peer review. So this is a really good development. But it also requires vigilance on the people who are receiving the information. We have to be skeptical, we have to be critical, and we have to demand the evidence. And so 
I'd like to leave you with what can we do, um, you know, as, as everyone is struggling for uh, finding something to hold on to. For, for me, this is what I hold on to. Uh, uh, I'd like for you to demand that people tell the truth um, and, and, you, and everyone here to tell the truth. Explain what we know and how we got to know it. And equally importantly, if not more importantly, explain what we don't know and explain when we might know what we don't know. And so with that, I'd, I'd, thank, I'd like to thank everybody for their attention. And uh, um, there's my email. If, if we don't get to your questions today, please. Um, one of the things that I enjoy doing during this time is answering questions. So I'll do my level best to answer any and all questions that come my way. And thanks so much. Thank you, Corey. That's a lovely segue now into moving into Q and A. Um, from very interesting discussion, and obviously our participants are finding this interesting also because questions are coming in, Corey. So just bear with me while I move over to um, to our platform. Um, I'm going to take away your screen. Um, No, I'm going to go from. So, can you see that, Corey? Just want to make sure. Super. Just want to make sure that um, they. Um, and I'm going to remind people again, just in case some people arrived late, how to um, how to access the Q and A platform today. We are accepting questions on the Q and A platform called Slido. S L I D O dot com. You'll be asked for an event code, and the event code today is E X L four two one. So the first question that I'm going to highlight today here is, Corey, a, a survivor of the Spanish flu states that people at his time were still frightful of large gatherings, even after the flu had ended. Will this be the case today? Um, I would say um, the short answer is yes. The longer, the little bit longer answer is um, there will be a, um, a incremental um, uh, decline in fear of large gatherings, but it should not be rushed. Um, I grew up in New York, um, or I grew up in New York, and after 9-11, um, a lot of things changed, um, and some of them were for the better. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that we should all have a healthy fear or a healthy um, um, skepticism of how important it is to go to a large gathering um, anytime in 2020. Once 2020 rolls around, uh, we'll have a lot more data and we should make the decision about how, I wouldn't say fearful, but how careful we should be about large gatherings um, year over year. Um, I, at today, I, my opinion, I think it would be foolhardy to pack 50,000 people into a sports stadium until we had a lot more data, another 12 months of data, uh, in my opinion. Thank you. Corey, how does the coronavirus affect your lung capacity? It's, uh, as it is said, that survivors end up having less capacity than they had before being affected. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, uh, the, as I mentioned, the virus can bind to cells deep within your respiratory system, so deep within your lungs, as well as um, uh, in your upper respiratory system. Um, the, 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 the most damage that occurs, occurs uh, based on the reaction of your immune system to the infection. So, um, in 1918, for example, most people who died and whose lung capacity was affected wasn't affected by the virus itself, but by secondary bacterial infections, which, which killed more than 70% of the people. And that proliferation of bacteria in your lungs in 1918 is what compromised your ability to breathe. Um, but long-term effects on your um, lung capacity are more likely due to 
your immune system responding to both the viral infection and possibly the bacterial infection afterwards. And this is a, this is a really a key point, is that um, your immune system is going to try to kill the virus and those bacteria at all costs. And some of the collateral damage could be the cells in your lungs that no longer have the elasticity that they once had. And so as we learn more about this disease and how to manage it, part of that management is going to be, can we modulate your immune system so that it's effective at uh, helping you rid your body of the virus, but not so powerful that it leaves that collateral damage. And that is one of the things that killed so many young people in 1918 because their immune systems were so robust, um, they, 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 over, they went overboard in fighting the infection, and that's what killed many. Okay, thank you. So, Corey, have you any idea what the labs and the companies are doing uh, in Vancouver in terms of COVID-19 treatments? And also, if you could add UBC, I know a later question asked specifically about UBC, so yeah. if you could share anything you know about that. Yeah, well, I actually, I wouldn't even discriminate necessarily uh, between or distinguish between Vancouver and UBC because almost every laboratory and company in Vancouver has an academic component. Either a founder came from UBC or um, some of the folks who were working in academic labs are now working in those companies. Um, there are laboratories, um, um, one notable one, a company called Abcelera, is working on um, antibody treatments with major pharmaceutical uh, companies. They already have candidates in development. Stem Cell, which is a Vancouver a, a, a company that was born and, and raised in Vancouver um, and is now worldwide, is providing research tools like cells um, to laboratories all over the world to study how viruses infect uh, lung cells. Um, there are um, a lot of, uh, nanomedicine is a huge um, um, uh, interest at UBC and Vancouver, and so we're learning how we can um, deliver drugs to the lungs. Um, and just my lab's interest is looking at those repurposing, repurposed drugs and making sure um, that we don't have the tragedies like that um, man in um, the U.S. who took chloroquine tablets for his aquarium and died. We, we need to know that some of that all these treatments that we're going to repurpose have it have a level of safety to them. Mm -hmm. So it's um uh, and I should also mention I know in my home department pharmaceutical sciences all of the labs gathered up every glove and mask they might have during the lab closures and donated all of them. So we're they're they're doing both direct and indirect support. Super, thank you. Corey, how might this pandemic change pharmacy practice? Um, well, I hope it, um, I hope one of the outcomes is that um, pharmacists um, become even more involved in frontline care. If you, if you see, um, if you follow the analogy to how, how nurse, how, how essential nurses have been to, uh, to treating patients in this pandemic. Pharmacists um, uh, are the drug experts. And so they're the ones who are going to help patients navigate um, uh, uh, which drug might work for them. Um, also, they're going to be the ones who are on the front lines delivering uh, potential vaccines. And it, I, just, I just see the pharmacist as, um, um, the, the really one of the first points of contact for individuals who should not be going to the ER, um, uh, giving the best, uh, the best current advice to patients. So I, I think in, in general, empowering more of the frontline healthcare workers, which very much includes community pharmacists. Super, thank you. I'm so, the next question, I'm so glad this came up, Corey, because this came in on uh, Thursday with our ethics speaker, and so we didn't quite get to it, but I know it's a question we're hearing over and over. So some folks are saying that the virus was made in a lab. Is this true? How do we know? Could it, could it possibly have been made in a lab? 
It, it's a great question. And there's actually two answers. There's an answer for COVID-19, but then there's the answer for COVID-20, which doesn't exist yet, but might. And so for COVID-19, by inspecting every single letter in the, in the virus's genome, we are able to um, uh, look back to the, uh, the bat version of this virus before it jumped, to the pangolin version of this virus before it jumped, and see characteristic letters in COVID-19 that are found in um, pangolin and in bat. Now, that doesn't formally rule out that, it could, that someone could have looked at the pangolin genome, the virus genome, and the bat virus genome, and then ordered all the little pieces of uh, RNA or DNA to stick together and recreate this virus. But it's incredibly inefficient right now. Um, and so in order to get a virus that actually functions and can infect would have taken testing billions or millions and millions of variants that you made in the lab. Now, and, and the timeline just doesn't fit. If this was an uh, episode of CSI, you'd say the timeline just doesn't fit. But knowing how fast this, this falls into the, uh, discipline called synthetic biology, creating DNA and RNA in the lab. And this time next year, it is definitely within the realm of possibility. If you start today and are dead set on creating a virus, you could get quite far. And so um, we need to put proper, um, not overbearing, but proper precautions in, in place. Um, so that um, the next virus is not, in, in fact, a synthetic one. But we can say with not absolute certainty, but a very high degree of certainty that COVID-19 was not synthetic. It was made by reassortment in nature. Thank you. And I'm going to skip the research at UBC because we covered that earlier. And so the next question, Corey, can we or are we learning from antibodies generated by infected people? What kind of information is available around that? Um, it's, it's very early days. Um, I'd say the best, um, the best um, information we have is um, based on so-called plasma therapy. And that is, um, the way that works is you, um, you take the blood from a person who has been infected and recovered, and then remove the plasma from that individual from that individual's blood. That plasma contains all of the antibodies in that person's uh, that was in that person's blood. And when that plasma is provided to an individual, uh, a, a new individual, it provides some degree of immunity. That's the best evidence that we have that affected individuals. Are, um, are mounting good immune responses that um, by analogy to a vaccine would give us hope that a vaccine, which all that is, is an immune response, uh, could, that a vaccine could work to give um, uninfected individuals um, the appropriate immunity to the vaccine, to, to, the, to the virus. What, we, what you may have heard of a lot about uh, in the past few days is that of people retesting positive after they uh, recover. Now, that, that seems that, that would give us uh, concern, but we still don't know enough. There are many ways you can retest positive. You could have recovered, but still have a few viral particles in your blood. And the tests are so sensitive that we're just seeing remaining particles. Um, we, but one thing we do not know is how well um, a, an affected, recovered individual can deal with a potential reinfection. That's the, that's the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. And more, that's why um, vaccine development is slow. Right. And the, 
and and forgive me if I didn't quite understand this, the possibility of more than one vaccine given the the mutation and and different way and the oncoming potential two or three waves. Yes, that's one thing that I've been very uh, encouraged to hear. Uh, uh, Bill Gates of Microsoft fame uh, and now the Gates Foundation, he's basically said his uh, organization is going to develop seven vaccines, seven different vaccines. Wow. Now that's a terribly um, inefficient way to go, but it's also um, it's a belt and suspenders way to go. It's to have a plan A, B, C, and D. And in fact, um, every big pharmaceutical company is engaged in developing their own vaccines. And some are engaged in developing vaccines that we've never even imagined before. Instead of putting a protein into a, into a cell and a mounting immune response, there are now techniques where you can put an RNA into a cell, have that cell turn that RNA into protein, and then mount an immune response. So this is, the vaccine developers are really pulling out all the stops. And that's important because it's by no means certain that we'll have one in 18 months. That's optimistic. But some vaccines have taken many, many years to develop. But I, I, I would say, I choose to be optimistic that 12 to 18 months, we'll see something that's at least partially effective. Thank you. With advanced technologies of computational modeling, is it possible to map possible mutational or mutation combinations and possibly prepare a combination vaccine? Guess Absolutely. And that is part of, that is one of the key differences between now and uh, 1918. We know every single, we know the, the, the code of every single virus and, the, and every single mutation in every one of those viruses. So imagine what you could do is you could say, you could do a correlation. This virus was particularly virulent. This virus with this mutation is particularly virulent. So computationally, you could synthesize the, 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 the most lethal virus on paper and use that to develop your vaccine. Or you could make multiple vaccines and combine them together. But um, I, I don't think we need um, uh, AI for this effort, but uh, uh, serious computing power and computational modeling will definitely come into play. It, it, I, I would be very, very surprised if it wasn't already baked into all the vaccines uh, that are being developed. Thank you. And Corey, what is provided as a treatment for COVID parents, patients currently? Is it just waiting for immune response, response to help in addition to assistance by ventilators? So I guess it's waiting for our immune system to kick in in addition to ventilators. Well, um, so that, that still is probably the primary treatment modality, uh, keeping patients hydrated, um, keeping their airways open. Um, but um, it, it really um, varies from patient to patient and doctor to doctor. Um, there's been fairly widespread uh, use on, a, on an as-needed basis with some antivirals. Um, there's the Ebola drug from uh, um, Gilead Pharmaceuticals, um, which uh, failed against Ebola, but uh, it's called Remdesivir, and it's, it's shown activity. It works by looking like a letter of the of the code of a virus, but it gets incorporated poorly, and it prevents the virus from replicating. Um, anecdotal or very small scale studies have been shown that those antivirals are at least partially effective um, at reducing the load of virus. The other way um, of treating a patient, um, I think I mentioned earlier, is to help modulate the immune response. So support the immune system of afflicted individuals, but also be on, uh, keep an eye out for when that immune system might go overboard and cause um, an inflammatory response that could be just as bad. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Macquarie, with so much information currently available in non-peer reviewed papers, what kind of information can be used really without compromising research quality? Um, this question I would love to take an hour on, um, uh, but I'll give you the short answer. The short answer is because they because a lot of the papers are put online in so-called preprints, they're they're meant to be peer reviewed. Um, but the idea is get them out quickly um, and um, the peer review will follow. So for anything that hasn't been peer reviewed, your skepticism should go up at least a notch or two. But keep in mind that the community who's looking at this information can be thought of as one large organic peer review system. So trust but verify um, is, is the approach I would take. Um, and there's there's nothing magic about peer review. Um, it's it's not foolproof. And so I think I think this is a, a going to be a key element of how science evolves because of COVID nineteen is is answering this exact question. I don't have the answer. Uh, if if information is you know, look at the data and interpret the data yourself. If, so what one one specific answer without passing the buck is I'd say pay less attention to the conclusions of a non peer reviewed paper and focus on the data and make your own conclusions. Hey, thank you. Good advice. So Corey, uh, this participant uh, states that they've heard a thing called herd immunity, which indeed we have, and it said that it is the only way to end the pandemic. To be skeptical, what exactly is it and can it actually help? Um, so what herd immunity is in a, in a very oversimplified manner is to let the, uh, to let the virus infect a, 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 a such a large number of people in the community that essentially everyone has been vaccinated against it um, naturally. Um, now, um, there's a lot of uh, controversy over whether or not um, now allowing herd immunity to take place um, really depends on um, the severity of the virus, the infectivity of the virus. It's very virus specific. And I would say um, if, if say the US were to take that approach, there would be a much larger number of deaths um, than, uh, than we're seeing now. Um, uh, and again, we don't know how well infection and recovery is going to protect you from reinfection. Um, that's, so, so that's a long way of saying, I don't know if it would work, but there's a, a, a natural experiment, experiment being um, conducted right now. And that is in Scandinavia, you have Finland, Norway, and Sweden, and Denmark, um, all the countries except Sweden have locked down in the way that we, we're now familiar with. Sweden has not. They've kept their restaurants open and most of their businesses and, and schools open. They're taking the approach of let herd immunity take root and, um, and, we'll, and the, com the community will be protected. Only time will tell. We'll, we'll have some pretty good data in the next several months as to whether or not uh, that was a reasonable approach, but it is definitely the natural experiment. Mm -hmm. And we understand that was the UK's first approach, I believe. It was, and uh, according to at least some individuals in the United States administration, the President of the United States was considering it until, um, until um, the numbers were presented. Thank you. Um, what will we learn in medical advances during COVID-19? Um, well, I would say, so one of my other interests is in, um, in uh, space biology and understanding mm -hmm. how um, biological systems operate in microgravity and, um, and, how, uh, uh, and how we can do experiments in those kind of environments. And I, I think uh, it, the optimist in me says that the experience that, um, all of uh, all of researchers in both um, medicine and related fields 
um, are, are dealing with during this pandemic will have the same kind of benefits that the, uh, the Moonshot project had in that we, we won't be able to anticipate them. But if I could put a little plug in for uh, a group I work with that's affiliated with UBC, but also present uh, across the world, it's called the Creative Destruction Labs. And uh, Creative Destruction Labs, or CDL, have hundreds of people asking this exact question, what can we do with this pandemic to either make sure it doesn't happen again or to develop new technologies for this for what society is going to look like after uh this pandemic so by by way of example telemedicine was beginning to take root before this pandemic it's going to be more popular and um, part of our lives in ways that we could not have imagined before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Sure, I know certain friends of mine in physiotherapy who are are uh, embracing telehealth now. Yeah, that, uh, like six weeks ago, would never have imagined that they were. Yeah, I, uh, I, still, I, I still don't like the idea of running a solo marathon. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping <laughs> we'll be able to get back to that. Yeah. Corey, have you any opinion, idea, what place in the world is the most likely to find a vaccine first? Um, this is just an opinion. Um, but given, if one follows the, 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 uh, the path that Germany has followed, I think they, they, both in terms of how they dealt with the outbreak initially, how they dealt with it, in at when it got to be its worst, how they implemented incredibly widespread testing. Um, I'd like to think that places like Germany and South Korea um, uh, are going to be at the forefront. But, you know, the, the entrepreneurial spirit of companies and academic labs in North America, um, especially with some of these new types of vaccines, these RNA-based vaccines, um, I, I, I wouldn't like to speculate. Yeah. Right. And so how much research is done on additional symptoms, for example, diarrhea, being a potential indicator of COVID-19, even without the more common breathing difficulties? Um, it's a great question. I don't know. And I think the reason, um, for the lack of information on this on this type of question is because um we still we have to appreciate it's such early days you know it, it, it although so much has happened it has all happened so quickly so we haven't i i'd say, at least to my knowledge we haven't been following secondary effects like diarrhea um uh, or other other markers of, of COVID-19. Uh, you, you may have heard about the um, loss of uh, the sense of smell mm. um, and how that was um, being looked into as a potential diagnostic or to, to supplement uh, diagnostic approaches. Um, I don't know how far that has gone. I also don't know how, um, how far looking at other gastrointestinal problems uh, has gone. It's a really important question, though, because um, uh, when individuals are tested, um, we definitely can find the virus in feces. And um, that's a very sobering thought when you think about societies that are so closely packed together and um, societies where sanitation um, is not up to um, the standards it needs to be, that we could be, uh, at least from a from a surveillance point of view, that's going to be something we should be looking at. Thank you. And this is uh, uh, um, looking for some confirmation on what we just what you discussed earlier. Are you saying, Corey, that there are two more waves of the coronavirus to come? No. Um, what I'm saying is that in 1918, um, when uh, it was a completely different virus. It was an influenza virus compared to a coronavirus. Um, we did see multiple waves of infection. 
And those waves were due to many factors, but at least one of the key factors was the fact that the virus mutated. So um, there are, there, just the way in 1918, there were many things that conspired to contribute to additional waves. Um, uh, if we don't know yet enough about the uh, mutation rate of coronavirus to say, oh, it's going to mutate and certainly come back in the fall in a more mutated virulent form. That's a question that science will be addressing in the next several months. But a non-scientific way that additional waves could come, at least one additional wave could come, if we all of a sudden too hastily relax the restrictions that have been so effective in flattening out the curve of infection, then um, common sense would say that people will start infecting each other all over again. The way you stop infections from increasing is simply lowering the number of people any one person infects to less than zero. If we start um, if we stop social distancing such that any one person in infects more than one person, the wave will start again. So that is so there's both a, a scientific component is and which we don't yet know the answer to, but there's a social component. If you push people together again or let people uh, come too close, then uh, you can probably predict a second wave. Thanks for clarifying that, Corey. Corey, if untreated, how long does the average length of COVID symptoms last for? Uh, this is part of the, the challenge of, of COVID-19. Anywhere from two to 14 days, um, which is very different from, uh, and that's why when uh, states and provinces and countries are looking at when they might um, um, start to reopen or lessen uh, their social distancing, uh, all the guidelines say you have to go for at least two weeks with, um, with a trend in the right direction. And that's because two weeks is uh, how long you could be symptomatic, which is almost five times longer than influenza. In 1918, you got sick and within 24 or 48 hours, you were, um, you were blue from lack of oxygen uh, and, and often dead. So, um, so this, this is one of the things that's completely new for us in, in this pandemic is the length of incubation and the length of, of being symptomatic. Okay, thank you. So I'm conscious of time, Corey, and it's now 2.09, but I've got the... I've got two quick questions that we could get through and there are other questions and we can share your email again with the people sure. who, whose questions you didn't get to. So, so the last but one question is, have you any idea how many surgical masks are being used daily by medical staff in BC uh, today and how many of these masks are made in BC? I do not know. I do okay. not And if if you have the virus, but you never got a test, you know, to know for sure, is there a way to tell if you previously had it or not? So I guess when we move. Yeah, um, you could you could have a relatively you could have a reasonable degree of certainty if everyone around you has gotten it gets sick and you didn't. Um, um, but though though that approach is better for populations. If you want to know on an individual basis, get an antibody test. Okay. 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 So that ends our question and answer session. And I'm just going to um, go out of here and go back. And I'm hoping everybody can see my final slide. Thank you, slide. Can, I just want to double check, Corey, is the last slide is the, no, so I just want to. Okay. Thank you. 
<laughs> switching between the screens can be a little can be a little tricky at times. So basically, first of all, Corey, thank you so much for that uh, very interesting discussion. I certainly feel a little bit more uh, informative today to be able to talk about uh, a little bit uh, more informative later. Um, and also a special thanks, Corey, because I know you're extremely busy with the uh, undergrad students who you're helping them to get through their final exam so it's very generous of you to give us some time today uh, so again thank you very much for that um, and of course last but not least many thanks to our participants today uh, for such great questions my apologies that we didn't get to them all I see them coming in um, so I do have Corey's email address here on, um, on the screen, corey.mislo at ubc.ca. I'm seeing if I can. Um, also a reminder that today's lecture will be on our uh, UBC Extended Learning YouTube channel. Uh, so for any of you that had to leave early or for any, any of your friends or, or uh, family that couldn't, um, couldn't get uh, get in get registered today and with that I'll say goodbye and thank you and um, just a reminder that we have a, our lecture our upcoming lecture on Thursday is with uh, Marina Milner Belotin supporting children's education during the pandemic so look forward to seeing you then and as always stay safe take care bye bye bye